For today, we are going to talk about the self in Western and Eastern thoughts. Okay, and in the previous discussions, we have been able to talk about philosophical self, sociological self, as well as psychological self. Okay, and this time, this is like an integration lecture wherein you're going to see once again some concepts from sociology, we're going to have some concepts from spirituality, and at the same time, we're going to take another look at culture and see how we differ from the definition offered by the West and the East, also known as the Oriental culture. Here's the exercise that I talked about last time, okay? So try completing the sentence five times. I am blank, okay? Think about your personal characteristics. If it would be helpful to you, pause the video lecture right now and try to list, try to list this sentence five times and complete it in five different ways, okay? And I'm curious about your answers. Before you proceed, with the next part of this video, I hope that you were able to do this exercise. Okay? Now, in my own way of filling up this blank, I would say things like, I am a student of psychology. I am a mental health professional. I teach at Lyceum of the Philippines University. Okay? I am from the city of Manila. Okay, so basically, that's the way I see myself. I hope that you were able to connect this with other topics that we have talked about, such as the self-concept and the schema. The self-concept is the collection of beliefs you have about yourself. Okay? And in order for you to be aware of your self-concept, because sometimes we're not aware of our own collective beliefs about ourselves, you need to sometimes do some exercises like this. Okay? And it will also help us in being knowledgeable about our schemas or our, the building blocks of, of our mind, of our thinking, of our thoughts. Now, I hope you were able to complete this exercise and try to look for a common ground in your answers. So what is the connection of those five IMs? Okay, I have encountered students who would actually put sentences or phrases that are alarming such as i am not good enough or i am not loved by my parents okay basically we have our own ways of completing this sentence but right now i'm going to adapt the lens of social psychology and cultural psychology in understanding how we differ in comparison to other cultures did you know that Filipinos are more likely to talk about their relationships with people when completing the sentence. Filipinos and other Asians are more likely to describe themselves by talking about their, relations, their relationships with the people around them. Like, I go to school, okay? I am a part of my family, okay? I am loved by my parents, okay? On the other hand, Westerners are more likely to talk about personal characteristics because they highlight how separate they are from other people. They highlight uniqueness because for them, individuality is more important than being connected to each other. Okay? Westerners are more likely to say things like, I am smart, I am responsible. Okay? There's nothing really bad about those things, but I hope you can see how we differ in comparison to the Western culture, okay? There are some cultures here in the East wherein we give the highest importance to family. Some cultures would give a lot of importance to respect. See, for example, Chinese culture or Japanese culture, okay? Respect is very important to them, okay? Sometimes it's also about honor. See, for example, among Chinese, honor is everything. And they try to honor their family in whatever they do. That's why they excel in school. They excel in their work because they don't want to dishonor their family. Okay? So basically, the society that we belong to help us in understanding how we define ourselves in writing these five 
IMs. First, let's take a look at the perspective of the West in conceptualizing the self. Okay, so even as early as the time of the philosophers, there is a heavy emphasis on the individuality or the separateness of the self. Okay, so ancient Greek philosophers see humans as bearers of irreplaceable values. St. Thomas Aquinas believed that the body constitutes individuality or being separate from others. So what makes you a separate being is the fact that you have your own body. Okay, and Westerners are more likely to emphasize separateness. That even though you're connected to others, you should maintain individuality, responsibility, choices, freedom. Okay, and another thing is that I mentioned this in our previous discussion, Descartes is famous for his quote, I think, therefore, I am. So basically, in the Western understanding of the self, there's a heavy emphasis on your recognition that you are a separate entity. That even though you belong to a certain group of people, what's important for them is for you to realize that you have your own identity. Even though you come from a certain family or you come from a certain culture, you have the capacity to make choices. Hence, what's important is for you to become a unique person. That may not be the case in the Eastern concept of the self. Okay? Now let's take a look at Frank Johnson's four categories of the self. Okay, so Johnson outlined um, categories of the self. In contemporary Western discussions, he is a psychiatrist and a professor. So let's define them one by one. The first is analytical or analytic. Johnson believes that the self is defined as an aggregate or of parts or a combination of parts. But at the same time, the self must be viewed as an entity or as an object separate from the environment and from other people. So in other words, analytical is about me versus the other. Okay. So even though you're a child who can play with your toys, who can, who can interact with your parents, the emphasis is that you should know that you are a separate being. Okay. The next is mono monotheistic. So this is another theme in the understanding of the self. Okay. And according to Johnson, um, one of our tendencies in understanding the self is that we believe that the self is modeled after a unitary omnipotent power. In other words, we believe that man was created by God in his image. Okay. The next is individualism, just like what I've been talking about since earlier. Okay. It's a Western thinking where self-expression and self-actualization are important ways of establishing who one is. So if you're from the West, there's a heavy emphasis on being the person you are meant to be. Okay? So what's important is for you to pursue your goals and not really to do what your parents are telling you to do. Of course, both perspectives have pros and cons. I'm just highlighting what is the focus in their culture. Okay? On the other hand, here in our perspective, for us, we think that it's desirable if a person can let go his or her personal desires for the good of all or for the good for the good of others. Okay, because we are collectivists instead of individualists. Okay, and the last is that rationalistic. Okay, I'm believing that people are rational, capable of analytic, deductive models of thinking. So the individual is rational. He or she can decide for himself or herself. No one is dictating you what you should do and if you have the power to decide on your own then you have to take responsibility over your own behavior try watching western movies okay typically when the plot is about a coming um, coming of age or someone going into college one common line i hear from american parents is that when their child will ask them so what will i do in college the parents will typically say it's your life, it's your choice. For them, it's okay. But here in the Philippines, I don't think that 
we can hear something like that often okay because for us we have we really give so much respect to elders that we cannot make decisions without considering their perspective okay cultural differences now let's take a look at the eastern concept of the self okay and when we say eastern this is a very generic term and countries from the east or from oriental countries we differ from each other okay say for example even though india is also in the east i would be honest by saying that i don't know all of their philosophies okay i only know that the things that are you know um discussed a lot in the literature say for example um, as a psychology professional i've been able to familiarize myself with the four pillars of indian psychology okay and here are four concepts that are important to them the first is dharma or the rules that describe goodness and appropriate behavior karma refers to movement from past incarnations that affect the present and the future i guess most of you are already familiar with the definition of karma so basically you will not see something like this highlighted traditionally in the west because um something like this will come from the east and i hope you can see that there's a heavy emphasis on on good relationships with other people okay not just being good as a person but rather being um, relating in a good way to other people the next is maya which refers to the distorted perceptions of reality and experience that can be identified as such only with direct attention to our own processes of awareness that come about through internal concentration and meditation so if you know someone who is very who believes uh, who who is a follower of indian philosophy or psychology then i would assume that that person is also someone who meditates a lot concentrates a lot who believes in the power of knowing oneself okay and they are very mindful about their behaviors because there are perspectives saying that mindfulness is very um, helpful when it comes to psychological health because you become more aware of your feelings of your emotions of your sensations and your thoughts okay and last is atman or the concept of universality in which the self is not seen as an individual but as part of the entire cosmos unlike what we have seen earlier wherein there's a heavy emphasis that the person is a separate entity here we can see in indian psychology that there's an emphasis that a person is not just a separate self but as someone who is connected to the entire cosmos you can be connected to other people you can be connected to to, to your country to the world to the universe okay and you can also be connected to a supreme being or to a god okay so connection is being highlighted in indian psychology and indian philosophy that's just one of the perspectives in the east okay the next tradition we're going to talk about is the buddhist tradition wherein they view the self not, not as an entity like i've been emphasizing since earlier but rather um it is a process it is an ever-changing um, process okay so according to buddhist tradition if you emphasize on looking for the self as an entity a substance or an essence it would be futile okay it would lead to nothing because you must realize that the self is not something that is fixed not something that that is constant but rather it is something that changes from time to time okay and i think buddhism is one of those traditions that would not emphasize the material needs of the person but rather they would emphasize that the person must be able to to um, let go of his materialistic needs okay and embark in a more spiritual journey of being connected to to the world and to other people okay so they have this doctrine called anatta which is often defined as no self or no soul okay and basically this supports their view that the self is not something that is that is fixed but rather they view it as something that is um that is changing or something that is um something that is continually evolving another view is confucianism okay and for them 
the self is not something that is formed through upbringing and the environment, unlike what we have been talking about in psychology, but rather for them, personality is achieved through moral excellence. Okay, and in order for you to achieve this moral excellence, they, you will have, you need to be familiar with the teachings of Confuci Confucianism, but they do believe that at the beginning of your journey, you should be able to, to be equipped with these four beginnings, with these four concepts. You should know them, although they are not the goal. Possessing these characteristics will help you reach your goal of moral excellence. And they are Jen, which is the heart of compassion, Yi, which is the heart of righteousness, Li, which is the heart of propriety, and Qi, and the heart of wisdom. So basically, if you're a believer of Confucianism, there's heavy emphasis when it comes to understanding your values and your morals, okay? And basically, it's a journey. So Eastern, Eastern thought is emphasizing that the self is not something that is eternal and not something that is fixed, but rather there's an emphasis that the self is ever-changing, okay? And mo some of them would actually would actually not pay attention to the materialistic side of the self, but more on the spiritual side. Now let's take a look at one application here, and this is called Nikon therapy. Okay, and in Nikon therapy, they view that self-centeredness is the source of problem. Okay, and this problem is something that many people should learn to overcome. Okay, and if you engage in Nikon therapy, there's a heavy emphasis in being aware of your thoughts and being able to connect with yourself in the environment. Basically, they give importance to mindfulness, okay? And it's like an in-house retreat, okay? And I heard that some, even some of those who practice Indian philosophy, they also do mindfulness retreats wherein they go on a silent retreat in a different place wherein nobody is allowed to talk with each other. They're only allowed to communicate with the environment through exercises such as meditation. Okay, And Nikon therapy, since the source of problem is self-centeredness, Nikon therapy aims to teach people how to relate better to others and how to be more grateful to other people. And, they, and the teacher or the, the sensei or the guide in Nikon therapy, he or she teaches the person in Nikon therapy, the trainee, the student, by, by, by using these three guide questions, which are, what did I receive from this person? What did I return to this person? And what troubles and worries did I cause this person? So it's all about awareness. It's all about awareness of your relationship with others. Okay, so that you will learn to give less importance to self-centeredness and give more importance to gratitude and relating well to other people. Okay, from a spiritual standpoint, let's change our lenses into a more cultural standpoint. And this time, another way to understand the self from the Eastern and Western thought is from the lens of individualism versus collectivism in this perspective okay this is also similar to individualism is similar to the view that the self is independent while collectivism is similar to the view that the self is interdependent not dependent because you don't want to be dependent or over dependent to your parents or to other people okay now how do we differ with Westerners or with individualists in defining ourselves. Okay, so let's look at the left side of this picture here. So if you are an independent person, you come from an individualist country, your definition of the self is not in connection with other people. So you always highlight what makes you unique in comparison to others. What are your characteristics that are not present among other people? What makes you unique? What can you bring to the group that they do not possess yet? Okay, what makes you different? Are you better compared to others? Okay, so in the in independent view of the self, there's a heavy emphasis on being who you truly want to be. 
Okay? While on the other hand, if you adopt an in the interdependent view of the self, you define yourself in relation to the people around you. Okay? So, maybe you can ask a Filipino to define himself or herself, for example, as a child, okay, as a certain, as children about their opinion about themselves, they might say things like, just like my mother, I like cooking. Just like my dad, I like exercising. My sister and I, we both like dresses. My brother and I, we both like playing computer. Both my co-worker and I, we studied psychology. Me and my friends, um, we are all, um, we are very patient people. We know how to wait, okay? So, we define ourselves in relation to others. There's less emphasis on uniqueness and more emphasis on what, is the, what, are, what are the similar characteristics between me and the people around me. It's not necessarily bad, but sometimes, if we're so close to each other, we forget to be who, who we really want to be. And for some people, that may be stressful. Okay, say for example, what if in your family, they have a negative attitude towards a certain gender? However, because of your education, you know that we should not discriminate people regardless of skin color, gender, etc. It's hard to make a stand in your family if their views are very similar to each other. That is the phenomenon in psychology called groupthink. If you experience groupthink, it happen, experiencing groupthink, it happens in situations where in, when a group of people are very close to each other, they fail to see the loopholes of their thinking, the loopholes of their schema. See, for example, if a group of people endorse a certain candidate, they may share posts, they may make statements about that candidate without looking at the possible loopholes of, of that candidate, without criticizing what they share, what they post. That's why they say that in psychology, one important thing to counter um, groupthink is to have what we call a devil's advocate. Okay? And what is a devil's advocate? For example, you are an officer in your organization, you should have a devil's advocate. Because if you're a part of an organization, especially if you're an officer, if you decide on something, there's a tendency for your subordinates to follow your decisions without questioning you. It's important to have a devil's advocate because a devil's advocate will present the other side of the equation so that you will learn that there are loopholes in your decisions, in your thinking, that should be replaced or you should consider other things before deciding on something. So now I want you to see that being interdependent or being independent is not necessarily bad or good. It depends on the situation. Okay, here's another summary slide of the differences between independent and interdependent. For a better reading material, I suggest that you visit the research article of Marcus and Kitayama back in 1991. Okay? But anyway, let's look at this. When it comes to identity, people from independent, um, people from individualist culture are more likely to define themselves by personal traits and goals. What do you want to be and who you are as a person? But people from collectivist country, interdependent, they are more likely to ident identify themselves as someone social in connection with other people. Okay? And for independent people, what matters is their personal achievements, fulfillments, their rights, and their liberties. While for in interdependent individuals, what's important for us would be the group goals. What do we want to achieve? We value solidarity. Okay? We value social responsibilities and relationships. Okay, so we do something not to feel good about ourselves, but rather we do something because we know that by doing that, we are helping others. We are doing something for our family. If you win something, someone from a collectivistic culture will say, first, I want to thank God. I want to thank my family. I want to thank my organization for helping me achieve this. Without you, I'll never be here. Okay, but 
a person who is more independent are more likely to say that thank you for recognizing my competencies and it's a hard journey but i feel like i deserve this achievement and there's nothing wrong with that it's just the way that they view things and sometimes because of our culture we tend to label a certain attitude or behavior as desirable or undesirable okay and what do these cultures disapprove or what do they what do what is it that they don't like in independent culture they don't like conformity when we say conformity changing your decisions attitudes or behavior to fit with the decisions of others so if you're from independent countries or individualist countries they don't like it when someone changes his or her attitude just to fit with the rest of the group they want you to express who you truly are but in interdependent countries we don't like egotism or is or what i'm saying is that we don't like people who don't pay attention to the feelings of others we don't want we feel that it's inappropriate for a person just to talk about himself but rather we want people to when they converse we want them to use the words we instead of i we want them to um, not highlight their own achievements because in our culture we would think that this person is you know his boasting about himself okay these are the cultural differences okay now let's look at the filipino self and like what i told you in the other lecture okay for filipinos the core value is kapwa okay and kapwa is something some sort of a unique concept because it doesn't have a direct english translation to it between fellow and others i think fellow is a better word than others because when we say others that is highlighting that you are separate from the other okay and like in kapwa okay we define kapwa is as the self and the others combined kapwa is our shared inner self that if i label you as my kapwa it means that i see myself in you hence if i think that you're having a hard time i should help you because if i'm in your situation it is expected that you will also help me okay so we pay attention to how other people are feeling about their situation okay that's why in our country it's negative if you're labeled as walang kapwa tao because what we're saying is that you don't possess the core value so when does a person become someone who who is labeled as walang kapwa see for example if he or she is very selfish if he doesn't share if he or she committed a crime against others okay and another value that is important is the value of pakikiramdam if kapwa is the shared inner self pakikiramdam is the shared inner perception or the awareness that there are certain behaviors that we should do in certain situations okay filipinos are less likely to be frank and less likely to be direct because we know that in our culture there are things that we no longer have to say because it is it is implied that even without saying you or you already know what you're supposed to do say for example if you're if you're not a filipino and you're going to tour the country we really appreciate people who help us when we need it we appreciate um, people who appreciate um, we we like it when people appreciate what we prepared for them okay because we are very hospitable towards our visitors okay and there are a lot of things that that we expect that other people will do in certain situations and it may take some time to be familiar with all of them okay now let's take a look at some examples applied examples of how do individualists and collectivists differ with each other so let me ask you what makes you happy as a person okay your answer may differ depending on which culture you came from okay so let's take a look at this japanese who are collectivists they're happy okay when they have good engagement with others when they feel close when they're friendly and when they're respectful so those are the things that they give importance to on the other hand what makes an american happy is with um is feeling some disengaged emotions such as feeling effective feeling superior and being proud about himself or herself okay another example individualism versus collectivists so in collectivist cultures when there are conflicts conflicts take 
um, conflicts take place between groups. So if you and me, we've had a certain disagreement, we're not the only ones who disagree with each other. The groups that we belong to may also disagree with each other because we're siding with the members of our own family. On the other hand, individualists are more likely to breed conflicts between individuals. So let's close our discussion by looking at Baumeister's three aspects of the self-concept. So let's connect the dots and see how we can describe ourselves from various perspectives. First, we have here what we call a private self-concept, or these are your this is how you perceive your own traits and your own behavior. Okay, so you can say things like, I think I'm responsible, I think I'm smart, I think I am good at public speaking. So that's the private self-concept. Well, the public self-concept is talking about the perceptions of others about you. So you can also describe yourself by saying that he or she, certain person, thinks that I am kind. He thinks that I am helpful. He thinks that I'm funny. He thinks that I am very um, loving. So that's the public self. And we also have a bigger umbrella called collective self. So the difference between public and collective self is that when we say public self, that's describing yourself from a perspective of another specific person, while in collective self, you're describing yourself from the perspective of a group. Say, for example, my organization thinks that I'm capable my family thinks i'm a good singer or my or my classmates think that i am a funny person okay so in other words even though we are interdependent or we are independent we are collectivists or we are individualists we can still be individualists in some way and individualists can also be collectivists in some way okay this is not either or but more of to, it, to what extent do you possess these traits? And you can have a balanced orientation. Sometimes you can be collectivistic. Sometimes you can be individualistic. Okay? Sometimes it depends on the situation. Okay? So I hope that after this, uh, that with this discussion, you were able to realize that our views of the self differ with the culture that we come from and the behaviors that we label as good or bad is also dependent on our culture of origin okay so don't think that if a certain behavior is negative in your own culture that it is also negative in another culture because what if that behavior is perfectly normal for them especially that we have different ways of viewing ourselves and knowing our self-worth so that is it for this discussion the self from the eastern and western thought i hope that you learned a lot from this discussion and see you in the next lectures